Hello, welcome to my presentation. My name is Tom Godfrey. I am a teacher and a teacher trainer, and I am the CEO of ITI Istanbul, which is a teacher training centre based in Istanbul, Turkey. And my topic is social and emotional learning for teachers. Although the title specifies teachers, the activities that I'm talking about can be used with learners of all ages and all levels of English and in different uh, contexts. I'd like to start by explaining the three principles that underpin my educational philosophy. Um, so firstly, learners need to be engaged, and so do teachers, in order for any learning to happen. Uh, second, learning is a social, dynamic and interactive process. So we learn by interacting and sharing and negotiating meaning with other people. And thirdly, only learners can learn. Teachers can facilitate the learning, but it's the learner's responsibility to do the learning. Uh, teachers cannot learn for the learners. And these three principles probably don't seem very radical to, to you. Indeed, I suspect most teachers would broadly agree with all three of those. However, in my experience, they're actually rarely followed in, in practice because most teachers pay these principles lip service, but fail to really understand uh, the implications of, of what these principles mean. So I'd like to start by looking at each one in, in a bit more depth. Um, firstly, learners need to be engaged and so do teachers. Um, but what is what does engaged mean? It's not like as teachers we can switch it on and switch it off, switch on engagement and switch it off like a light. Um, there's a range of engagement. So from being physically present in the classroom um, or in the Zoom room if it's online, uh, sort of being mildly interested in, in, in the topic while scrolling through our mobile phone um, and then being totally absorbed so obviously the aim is is to to really get learners engaged is is they're going to be in a state of total absorption um, sometimes this is described as being in a state of flow where time seems to stop and the learners are totally concentrated on a task um, and this is not a state that as teachers we achieve often I mean it does happen but it's not it's kind of not the norm so I believe engagement needs to encompass the whole learner um, it's a, a holistic so the learners need to be engaged physically mentally emotionally and socially um, and this this does not occur automatically and as teachers our responsibility is to build that engagement, to encourage that engagement. The second principle, learning uh, is social, dynamic and interactive process. So learning occurs through interaction, sharing ideas, negotiating meanings. Um, and in order for this to happen, we have to create a safe learning environment a safe environment where learners are happy to self-disclose and talk about themselves. Um, and the nature of the interaction between the teacher and the students and between the students themselves is where the, the learning happens. So how as teachers can we create this open dynamic learning atmosphere? Again, it's not something that happens naturally. It, it's something that needs to be built. And the third principle, only learners can learn. Teachers can facilitate the learning. 
Um, traditional models of education view teaching as a process of the teachers transmitting knowledge to the learners. And in this format, content is, is the king. So the curriculum is everything. And learning is equated with how much of the material is absorbed by the learners. So it puts the learners in a passive position and it puts all the responsibility on the teacher's shoulders. Um, but it doesn't work. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, all teachers know that it's only the learner who can do the learning. The teacher cannot learn for the learner. So my third principle highlights the vital role um, the teacher plays as a facilitator of learning. Um, so showing through examples how to create a rich learning environment in which the interaction um, and a, a positive group dynamic is the most important element of the learning process. Most teachers and institutions seem to see their role as one of social control rather than social engagement. So many institutions um, demonstrate this physically. So the learners are arranged in rows, um, separated from each other. So you can only see the side of the student's face or the back of the student's head. And there's limited eye, co eye contact is limited. Everyone's eyes are focused on the teacher. And the opportunities to interact are, 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 are limited. Signs on the walls um, give instructions about behavior, rules, regulations. And this isn't a positive learning environment. In order to create a positive learning environment, we need to do the opposite. We need to have learners arranged in groups where there's maximum eye contact, uh, maximum opportunities for interaction with other learners, walls displaying learners' creativity, samples of their work, exposure to um, language, if it's a language class. So in my principles, I put creating a positive learning environment, a safe dynamic place in which learners can interact freely as my first priority and everything else, including the curriculum, content, examinations, um, is all subservient to the aim of creating a positive learning environment. Um, so the positive learning environment supersedes the content and the curriculum. So this means I can devote time and activities that aim to achieve this. So activities that aim to build trust, to develop empathy, to develop group cohesion, team, team building activities, act awareness activities um, to raise awareness of yourself um, and other people. And these are the, the criticism often that I hear about these kind of activities when I demonstrate them to teachers is they cannot do them in their institution because of a lack of time, the curriculum is too heavy. They, they have a lot of material to cover. Um, time is limited. The activities aren't in the exam, so they won't help the learners pass the exam. They haven't been trained in these kind of activities and so on. <clears throat> and these criticisms are all valid if the priority is content, if the priority is covering the curriculum. Uh, but the criticisms kind of disappear if um, the priority is to create a positive learning environment, because all of these activities are doing that. Um, so many teachers and institutions try to limit 
and control the interaction between learners um, in order to cover the material, for the teachers to cover the material. Well, I believe they should be doing the opposite. I think they should be increasing opportunities for learner-learner interaction so that real engaged learning can take place. So I think uh, these three principles have profound implications um, in terms of how we create a positive learning environment. These ideas aren't new. Um, the, the ideas of a learning-centered pedagogy. Um, Paolo Freire in 1998 talked about the relationship between teachers and learners as one that is complex but key to the learning process and something that needs to be worked on. Uh, Carl Rogers equally talks about learners having to take responsibility, learners having to be involved and engaged and autonomous in their learning. What is the reality of being a teacher today? Uh, teaching as a profession is going through a crisis, I think. Um, many teachers suffer from burnout. Um, the workload is heavy. The job can become stale and routine. Teacher creativity or teacher development is, is not widely encouraged. 50% of teachers leave the profession in the first five years. And in Europe currently, there's a huge shortage of teachers. Um, more than 75% of teachers are leaving the profession than joining it each year. Why is this? Um, well, I think it's because we need to change our priorities. We need to start thinking of learning as um, in terms of the social and emotional elements. And this brings us on to sell. What is social and emotional learning? Um, well, this is a framework drawn up by CASEL, the Collaborative, uh, Collaborative for Social and Emotional Learning, CASEL. Um, and they've outlined five competences. And they all relate to raising awareness of our, our self-identity and our, our uh, relationship to other people. Um, so if we look at these five core competences and think about how they contribute to the kind of learning environment and the relationships that you want in your classroom, and not only in your classroom, but they are relationships that can be fostered in the school generally and in the community. So self-awareness. Self-awareness is about how we know and understand ourselves, our emotions, our thoughts, our identities. How do we feel in any given situation? Why do we feel that way? How do we understand ourselves? How can I accurately understand myself? How do I fit into my community, my job, my family, the world? Um, do I have a strong sense of identity? And if I do, that strong sense of identity helps um, like a buffer against negative life experiences and it supports academic, social, emotional outcomes. So when we focus on self-awareness, we're giving learners opportunities to think about their own experiences, their own emotions, how do they deal with things. And very often this is kind of avoided in the classroom. Um, but if you have a strong awareness, then that's going to help you process emotions and experiences and communicate in helpful ways. So they're all part of the learning process. 
Um, so just take a moment to reflect. Um, how does self-awareness, what does it mean to you in your life? How does it connect uh, and how can you use it to support your learners? This is a trust building activity uh, where one person is the guide and the other person closes their eyes and essentially blind. Um, and this is useful because we rely on our sight to perceive the world. And as soon as you close your eyes uh, and do some of these blind exercises, then you become much more aware of um, the other senses, um, how the other senses enhance our capacity for perceiving the world in different ways. And also reflecting on the activity, um, it's interesting because some people find it very difficult to keep their eyes closed. So this is an issue in terms of trust, but in trusting yourself and trusting your partner. Um, so this can lead to reflections about how do we cope with difficulties? Um, did you open your eyes in the activity? If not, how did you resist the temptation to open your eyes? And if you did open your eyes, um, how can you handle I mean very often we're on a on doing a task and we get intrusive thoughts come into our minds so how do you handle these intrusive thoughts that are trying to distract you from a task that may be difficult and often it's the reflection on these activities um, that in involves self-disclosure and that's where the learning opportunities um, are enhanced Another way of um, raising self-awareness is through personalization. I mean, this is something that uh, we could do in the classroom um, in many ways. I mean, by showing interest in the learners, in the learners' lives, how they feel, how they feel about activities in the class, by asking open-ended questions, eliciting responses, by highlighting learners' contributions, and an activity that I like is what I call I statements, uh, where essentially you have sentence, stem, sentence stems uh, which the learners complete for themselves. So, for example, my favourite place at home is in front of the television, by the fire. Um, so they can be practising specific language, uh, like prepositions of place or describing, so number one and... Um, five are describing spatial relations. On a bus, I like to sit near the back or near the window. Um, or they could be focused on other grammar areas. I love verb plus ing, gerund. I love uh, dancing or I hate. Um, and then once the learners have written sentences about themselves, then they can share this information with their partners and this is all part of raising awareness and self-disclosure, as well as uh, a controlled practice activity um, for language. Self-management is not just understanding who I am and how I feel, but what am I doing with this information? How am I managing my feelings? How do I turn my self-awareness and my emotions into positive actions, actions that are going to make things better for myself and, and for others. How do I plan? How do I work towards goals I want to achieve? So when we focus on self-management, 
we give learners the opportunities to sort of process experiences, to reflect on experiences um, and work towards goals. And this is something um, that adults uh, need. I mean, this is a, an issue for adults as well. Um, very often as adults, we have to have strategies for coping with negative emotions, particularly uh, on training courses where very often I will get um, a trainee come to me and say, um, I worked very hard on the course, I did my best, I learned a lot, but I, I'm very disappointed, I'm very upset, I can't get over this disappointment because I only got a pass grade and, and not a, a grade A. Um, and you say, well, look, you've got no control over the grade, but you have got control over how you perceive your experience. And you've said that you worked very hard, you did your best and you learned a lot. I mean, these are all positive things. You know, why, why do you have a negative? Why are you putting a negative emotion onto onto your experience? How can you manage this? How can you overcome? Uh, how can you take agency? How can you take control of, of your emotions? Um, this is a, again, this is an extension of the blind trust activity that I showed earlier. Um, but here we raise the stakes. Um, so it's about trusting yourself and trusting your colleagues. Um, and basically this activity is where you run at a wall and you have to trust your colleagues that they will shout stop before you crash into the wall. Um, and it's clear from the body language and, and purposefulness of the running how much control the participants feel. So some people are much more tentative than others. And then this can lead to reflections on the nature of risk. Um, our desire to take or avoid risks. Um, how do we manage our emotions? Um, for example, our, our, in terms of our ability to trust ourselves and other people. So, I'm also a great believer in the power of positive affirmations. Um, so I'd like you to repeat these statements after me. So you can just repeat them in your head or you can repeat them out loud if you're sitting in a room with nobody else um, around you. I am clever and smart. I am a fantastic teacher. My students are lucky to have me as their teacher. I am wonderful. I am wonderful. And I think if we say these positive affirmations to ourselves often enough, we start to believe it. Um, and if we believe it is true, then it is true. Unfortunately, what happens is too often teachers, you know, if you overhear teachers in the staff room, um, then very often they're saying the opposite things. They're saying negative things like, um, you know, I, I'm not I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm not. I, I have problems, I, my students, etc, etc. Et we don't kind of confirm uh, the, positive, the positive things. Similarly with learners, I'm a great believer in giving positive feedback, giving praise. Obviously it has to be genuine and it has to be um, seen as genuine. Um, but if we acknowledge the positive behaviour and ignore the negative behaviour, that can have a major impact on the classroom atmosphere. I mean, very often learners, when they are behaving negatively, they are doing that in order to get attention to themselves. And if the teacher responds to that negative behavior, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, now be quiet or I'll send you out, etc. 
um, then what we're doing is we're just reinforcing it because the learner realizes that the negative behavior is attracting our attention. We don't want that. We want the opposite. We want to, the learners to know that we are attracted to their positive behavior. Uh, social awareness. This is about our ability to understand others, uh, how they feel, to have empathy, and to put ourselves in, in the shoes of another person to, and to understand and appreciate their perspective. Um, and when we focus on social awareness, we give learners opportunities to realize how other people are feeling, um, to show compassion, to show empathy, um, and understand other people. So it's all about um, accepting others, respecting others, including others, giving a sense of belonging. And this is really important in creating a positive learning atmosphere, because if you've got one or two students who feel um, not included, not welcome, out of the group, that is going to affect their motivation and achievement. This is a group activity where the, the group has to respond as a group. And these kind of activities help develop group cohesion, group cooperation, and raises awareness of others. Basically, this is a very simple activity. Um, the group stands in a room and the leader says, OK, one person walking and only one person in the group can walk, but they can decide when they want to stop. And as soon as they stop, somebody else has to start walking. Um, but you need to be aware of what the whole group is doing, because only one person can walk until the instruction changes and then it may be two people walking or three people walking or everybody walking and then it can be reversed everybody walking only one person standing still two people standing still um okay, let's make it three people walking This is a great team building activity which involves um, participants working together. Basically everyone stands in a circle and thinks of a sound um, and then they say the sound to their partner, to the person next to them in the circle um, and then the circle disbands and everybody finds a space in the room close their eyes and the aim is without opening your eyes only listening to the sounds try to find your partner and recreate the original circle
relationship skills includes the things that we do when we interact with others. So um, how leading to sort of positive, meaningful, supporting relationships. So it's, it's basically how do we communicate and how do we listen? Um, how do we build on each other's ideas? How do we disagree? How do we cooperate? Uh, how do we lead? How do we help others? How do we rely on others? How do we ask for help? Um, so we need to give opportunities for learners um, to develop these skills. And these are, these are life skills, essentially. Um, and if you have strong relationship skills, you know how to work together, you know how to share ideas, you know how to solve problems, you know how to speak up when there's something going wrong, you know how to listen, you know how to work out solutions, you know how to uh, correct mistakes. Um, these are all very uh, useful skills. Uh, how do we develop them? Well, basically, we can give learners problem solving activities. This is, as most of my activities are that I've shown, this is another physical activity, but it could be a, a mental activity or a, a, a social activity. This is um, a team problem solving activity where one person is a zombie and the group have to work together to prevent the zombies sitting down. Um, so there is one empty chair and the group have to make sure that they occupy the empty chair before the zombie can sit on it. I'll show you a brief demonstration. So the reflections on this activity can lead to interesting discussions. Um, so how did the group work together? Uh, was there a leader? How did you communicate? How effective was the communication? Um, how did you solve the problems, um, etc.? Responsible decision making. This involves the way we investigate a, quest, a question or a problem to understand it in a deeper way um, and thinking about the consequences or the possibilities of different decisions. So it's all about giving opportunities for learners to uh, be open minded, to find choices that are theirs to be creative, uh, how to gather information and use that information to make decisions, how to be critical thinkers, um, how to be creative thinkers. Um, this activity is a group problem solving activity again, um, where the learners are put into a knot they're tied up as a knot and they have to untie the knot take one hand and hold. <laughs> now put your left hand into the middle and take a different hand another hand <laughs> we have a problem we have created a knot Without letting go of the hands, you have to keep hold of the hands. You have to unravel, untie the knot. 
I would really recommend this tea, this workshop to all teachers because um, in this in this time most of our students are so lethargic they need lots of motivation okay you find the students have maybe they're hopeless they are not interested but if you did something new like the games then it, 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 it becomes engaging for them and it gives them a sense of purpose uh, it gives them an immediate uh, target to meet and uh, so they, they come up in the class and what I love about this it is not that it applies to a certain level it can work across the levels right from the, the young learners to the adults <laughs> Reflections on this activity can be quite interesting because they can lead to discussions about how motivated were you to solve the problem? Uh, how did you feel when it became difficult to solve the problem? Um, did you want to give up? Did you give up? Um, who encouraged the group to continue? Did you solve the problem? What made you persevere? Was there a breakthrough? So this kind of reflection on, on, on problem solving is um, can, can, can lead to a discussion after the activity. Take one hand. So what next? Um, well, to sum up, um, I can say that no learning can take place if learners feel afraid, unsafe, depressed. Um, so a safe and welcoming environment is critical if learning is to happen. Sometimes uh, teachers will say things like, yeah, but I mean, social and emotional learning. I mean, I'm not a therapist. My job is to teach my subject, my content. Um, you know, it, it's not my position to deal with the learner's emotions and how they are feeling. But you don't need to be a therapist to show empathy and support. Uh, in, in fact, Showing empathy and support is a, a very human um, characteristic. And I would say it's an essential quality of being a teacher as well. Um, so we need to, a positive and learning environment is created um, through interactions um, and a, a positive group dynamic. Um, and you can build these 
social relations and positive rapport and a positive group dynamic through participatory learning. So we need to engage the learners socially and avoid the idea of control, social control. So holistic education um, acknowledges the whole learner and has to, we have to meet their physical, mental and emotional needs as well as their needs for content. So to sum up, I would say the better the relationships in the classroom, the better teachers can teach and the better students can learn. And I am do a number of, well, in, in, in the summer, I do a workshop called Facilitation Skills Masterclass, and it's over a weekend. Um, and it's where I demonstrate a lot of these activities um, to develop facilitation skills, which obviously includes emotional and social, social and emotional learning and developing a positive learning environment. Don't take my word for it. I will conclude by showing you testimonials from two of the people who did the workshop last year. I can honestly say that this course was uh, super fun and fabulous and uh, I do recommend it to all the teachers and managers who want to feel a kind of change in their teaching atmosphere. Definitely join in the workshops here uh, presented by Tom because they are very interactive, very enjoyable. We had a lot of fun about the workshops and it's very informative. You, you get lots of ideas about how to integrate these facilitation skills into your classes. Because of that, I would definitely recommend these workshops to you.